praise. We want to say thank you so much for giving us the opportunity that we can gather together to worship you, to praise you, to glorify, to magnify your name once more again. On a day like today, on a day of Feast of Trumpets, a day that you've ordained, it's a holy day, it's a hallelujah, it's a biblical feast. Glory to God, and we've come to present ourselves to you. And we're gonna, and we have started to make a joyful sound unto you. And we, I pray, Lord, as I minister the word of God, that you'll quicken your word and make it real and relevant to every one of us. Give us all deeper spiritual understanding. Let a fresh anointing rest upon all of us to hear your word, receive your word, and also truly be doers of your word. And for all of us to receive all that we need to receive from you. You know exactly where we're at. You know exactly where every one of us are. Those are online. Those of you who are present to receive, to go forward. To go to new levels, new heights, new depths in you. Oh, we give you the glory, we give you the praise. Quicken your word once more again. And I thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name. Magnify your word, Lord. Amen. 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 Leviticus chapter 23. I'm reading from King James, so you may not have a King James, so that's okay. Just follow with me as I read. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Verse 23 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, so he says, you speak to them, you command them, in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. And those of you who are with us, we see in the last Bible study, we see this word holy convocation. That word convocation, when you look at the Hebrew and you look at the root for what it means, it, it, it means several things, but one of the things it means is a rehearsal. And we found out in the Bible study that according to the New Testament, when Paul, Apostle Paul wrote, he said all these biblical feasts are, 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 are shadows, they're types. They will find the fulfillment in Christ. We know that uh, Jesus has fulfilled the first four feasts. That is uh, uh, Passover. Uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost. He was the Passover Lamb, thank God. He was un when he went into the grave, he was the Unleavened Bread. For seven days, the Jews were to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Bible says his body came out of the grave three days, three nights later. His body saw no corruption. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So he fulfilled that. He rose again from the first day. He rose again from the dead on the first day of the week. Three days, three nights later, that's when he rose again from the dead to fulfill first fruits. He fulfilled that. Fifty days later after that was Pentecost, and Jesus fulfilled that. He went to God the Father, and God the Father sent his spirit, and God the Father poured out his spirit. The Bible calls him uh, a comforter. He's a paraclete. He's our helper poured out his spirit, deposited his spirit into the hearts of believers. He's made a deposit, a down payment, indicating that, I'm, uh, that I will complete this transaction. We are engaged to him Amen. as a bride. We're engaged to him. It's like the story I was sharing with you of the Jewish wedding on um, a typical ancient Jewish wedding. A man would approach a father. If he was interested in a woman, he just could not approach a woman first. He would have to go to the father and talk to him first. If the father was in agreement and an and agreement for this man to marry his daughter, he would have to bring, they'd set up a meeting at a time, he would have to bring a dowry. Well, Jesus has paid the dowry. He paid the price. His blood paid the price for the wedding, for the marriage, for his bride. So the man would have to come to the father with a dowry and they would sit down, him, the father, the parents, the daughter, and they would have a contract. They'll enter in a covenant agreement. Now we can relate to it because we celebrated um, Passover, uh, uh, the, the Passover Seder, when we drink the cups of wine. Remember them? Right? I remember when Jesus, the night before he was crucified, he took one of the cups and he said, this is the New Testament in my blood. And basically the language he was speaking to the disciples as they partook and they drank of the, the, the cup of wine, they knew it had to do with marriage because that's what it was all about. This is with the custom. So when a man with a woman and, he's in, and wants to get engaged after he's, they've signed the contract, um, if the woman accepts a cup of wine from the man who wants to marry him, it means that she's in agreement for the marriage. So when the disciples accepted the cup, they were in agreement for the marriage. When you and I accept the cup, we've entered in a covenant relationship with him. Amen. Glory to God. 
And we know after 50 days after Jesus rose again from the dead, God poured out of his spirit, his spirit upon the believers, 120 that was gathered. That was his deposit, a down payment, said, I'm coming back, I'm going to redeem you. We know from scriptures, the only thing new about you and myself when you become a born again Christian is your spirit. It's your responsibility to renew your mind. Amen? And your body is the same old body. Amen? Amen? But as you get into the Word of God, hallelujah, you learn how to uh, uh, be led by the Spirit and be governed by the Spirit. You can regulate your soul, that's your will, your intellect, your emotion. You can regulate your body. The, the Spirit man is in charge. So if there's anything wrong with your physical body, it can be healed. The Bible says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. So it's all de dependent on what's going on in your soul. How you, how you responding to certain things, how you consent to certain things, how you react to certain things. So our soul has a lot to do with what's going on with our physical body. But yet, the spirit man is supposed to be in charge. So Jesus made the deposit. He paid the price. He, you know, his dowry was his blood that was shed. He purchased you and I. Glory to God. Fifty days later, God made a deposit. Said, I'm coming back for you. I'm going to redeem you. Our bodies, our whole being. And the salvation will be complete. The, the fifth um, feast, which is the Feast of Trumpets, has not yet been fulfilled yet in Christ. Nor has the Day of Atonement been fulfilled yet in Christ. Nor the Feast of Tabernacles has not been fulfilled in Christ yet. Feast of Tabernacles speaks of the millennial reign. Amen? For a thousand years when the saints will reign with him. That has not yet been fulfilled, but we're not far from it. The only thing that's separating us from that is seven years of tribulation. Seven years of tribulation is fast approaching. Fast approaching. COVID-19 is a precursor of what is coming. All what's going on with COVID-19, all the negative things, all you perceive as negative things, is an indication of what is coming. So all of us should be prepared and ready. Say, so, you know what? I don't want to be caught off guard. Luke chapter 21, verse 36 says, Watch and pray that you may be counted worthy to escape the things that are coming upon this earth, that you may be able to stand before the Son of God. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Sorry. It says the Son of Man but it's Jesus, that you may be counted worthy to escape and also to stand before the Son of Man referring to Jesus. He's our judge. All right? So things are fast coming. It's fast approaching. And so when we understand that, we realize, okay, as we understand God's times, seasons, feasts, you type back to the Hebrew word moed, we begin to put things together and we see God has appointed times. Today is one of them. Hallelujah, where we meet, we present ourselves, try to understand what it's all about, and we try to position ourselves so it's well with us. Again, the word says, holy convocation. It's a rehearsal. You know, when an, um, if you've ever been to any plays, I know when I was growing up in high school or in grade school, sometimes we were in plays, and before we presented, we would rehearse. We would practice. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You know what it's like to, to act, and, or, or even um, in music. I was in a high school band, and we would rehearse, we would rehearse, rehearse, and the day would come when we would have to perform. Well, well, the day when we have to perform is no longer a rehearsal, it's a real thing. The day when the play comes to put on the play is no longer a rehearsal. You dress up with all your costumes, everybody's in place, we've practiced it for so long, everything should go off well, because you've rehearsed it. This, these feasts, these shadows of things to come, are all rehearsals for future. They were speaking of the future, and we see that some of them have been fulfilled. Some of them have not yet been fulfilled, and yet it's fast approaching. We know that we found out again in the Bible study, one of the fulfillments, or it's believed, one of the fulfillments for the Feast of Trumpets will be the coming of the Lord, the rapture, the, take, the catching away, all that. Um, it also, we know that, again, when Isaac, sorry, when a Abraham was about to kill Isaac, when he was lying on the wood and he was about to bring down the knife and kill him, God interrupted that. And we know that um, God said, Abraham had told Isaac, God will provide a sacrifice. And he did. He provided a lamb. And in, the la in a thicket close by was a ram caught by its horns. And the lamb was killed. The lamb was sacrificed. The horns 
were preserved and God showed them that, uh, showed, showed the Jewish people that you can blow the shofar and, you know, make a shofar a trumpet out of those horns. So you see the connection? Isaac is a type of Christ, right? Messianic, speaking of Jesus who will come in the future. And yet we've got the shofar that's coming out of it. When the shofar is blown, it's the voice of the Lord in the earth. Things happen when the shofar is blown. Hallelujah. And I'm referring to shofar because the shofar and trumpet is used interchangeable. All right, the, 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 the ram's horn. And this is the day when the ram's horn is blown and blown and blown. A time of blowing, a time of rejoicing, a time of breakthrough, a time of celebrating, a, a time of change, a time of transition, a, a, a time of all kinds of things. But it all happens in the, this month. The, and this is happening on the first day of the seventh month. So today is the first day of the seventh month going forward. Hallelujah. And you'll find that uh, the seventh month is considered to be the most holiest month of all the months, all of all the biblical months. So what's interesting, today is a normal Sabbath, which is a holy day for God from God's perspective. Hallelujah. If you don't want to keep the Sabbath, that's okay. But from God's perspective, it is a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a Sabbath. Not only is it a normal Sabbath, but it's also uh, the, the Feast of Trumpets. So it's like we've got a double Sabbath going on. Yes. Amen? The heavens are open up even more. You, you, you can expect great things to happen if you enter in. It's all about if you enter in. It's all about what you want out of it is what you'll get. The Christian walk is very much like, like that. Right? What you put into your Christian walk is what you get out. You put zero in, you're going to get zero out. Right? It's all about your relationship with you and Jesus, maintaining that relationship. The, more, the closer you draw to him, the more he will draw to you. The scripture says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Right. You choose not to draw nigh to God, he's not really drawing nigh any closer to you. Right. You can go as far with God as you want, or you can stay as, way as far as you want to stay with God. All right? so it's all up to you. You don't blame it on the devil. Well, I, you know, some people want to blame it on the devil. Well, I can't draw close to God because of the devil. No devil in hell, no devil in hell, out of hell. Wherever he, he abodes can stop you from drawing nigh to God. It's your, you make that decision in your soul, in your will. You make a decision. I want to draw closer to God. It's up to you. It's you that makes that decision. And as you make that decision, you ask God for help, he will help you to draw closer to him. The Holy Spirit is the one that draws you and I unto God the Father. But, but without the Holy Spirit, it's not going to happen. So when we take that step towards him, he will take giant steps towards us. You may just take one small step towards him. He's taking giant steps towards you. Don't ever forget that. He, his, his steps are going to be far bigger than what you're going to take. Yeah. As, soon as, as, as long as you start to turn your face towards him. As the psalmist says in Psalm 27, that, uh, Lord, you said unto me to seek you. My face will I, thy face will I seek. The psalmist was making up his mind. Your face is the one who I'm going to seek. Yes. I'm not interested in seeking anybody else. It's you I'm going to seek. And he put his face, the psalmist, positioned his face to seek the Lord. Yes. And as he did, God drew nigh, closer to him. Remember, God hasn't changed. Okay? He's the same today as he will be yesterday and he will be tomorrow. And know this too, the enemy hasn't changed either. He's the same as he was yesterday, as he is today, and he will be tomorrow. He can't change. He has no creative power in him to change. Yes. All right? He's stuck. The, the way he is today is the way he was eons ago when he fell. But I'll tell you something, he is deteriorating, but he's the same. If he, if he lied in the past to Eve, he'll lie again. If he deceived Eve, he'll try to deceive you. So his tactics haven't changed. Just understand how he operates. Also understand how God operates. God is the same today, yesterday, and will be tomorrow. So he's very consistent. The good news for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So we should not forget that. It's not God's will that anyone should perish. It's God's will for all of us to draw closer to Him. Amen. Glory to God. So, so not only do we see this seventh month as a special month, it seems to be the most holiest month, but, um, and I want to encourage you, believe God for miracles throughout this month. Believe God for miracles, breakthroughs, whatever, it is, whatever is going on in your life, whether it's financially, marriage-wise, relationship-wise, job-wise, or the lack of it, or whatever it is, health-wise, whatever it is you need God to come through for you. Uh, legal documents, whatever that is, immigration, whatever it is, believe God to bring it about this month. Hallelujah. Charge your face. 
Glory to God. You go with me to, uh, to uh, uh, Numbers chapter 29. Numbers chapter 10, 29. We see similar words here again. And in verse 1, the Word of God says, And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You should do no civil work. In other words, work is not that important that day. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. And of course, it goes on to talk about bringing your offerings. If this is one of the times you bring your special offerings, saints. All right? Now, if we just pause here for a moment just to show you how important this month is. Not only do we have the first day of the month being kicked off with the blowing of trumpets, but uh, 10 days later is the, is the day of atonement. Look, look at verse 7 of the same chapter. You shall have on the 10th day of the 7th month a holy convocation. There it is again. And ye shall afflict your souls, and ye shall not do any work therein. So that's a day of atonement. For this year, it starts on a Sunday evening, September the 27th. It's all day September the 28th, which is a Monday. So if you, if you want to enter in a time of prayer and fasting, seek in the face of God, that's a day. If you want to arrange to take the time off from work, go ahead and do it. We're going to be gathering here seeking God. We're going to be gathering here to pray and, and drawing close to God. All right? That is a holy day. So that's another day. And then you come to verse 12. I'm, I'm just showing you what, what's happening throughout this month from God, on God's calendar. Verse 12, what do we see here? And on the 15th day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. There it is again. Ye shall do no civil work, and ye shall keep the feast of the Lord seven days. So the first day of the, the first day of the feast of Tabernacle is a holy day. It's a Sabbath. Amen. It starts off with a Sabbath, and if you continue reading, it ends with a with 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 with, with a Sabbath too as well. So it's book ended. So we've got all this going on in the seventh month. Glory to God, and and therefore it, it it's really an exciting time, and when we begin to understand it. Um, when, we, when we look in the scriptures, um, seven symbolizes completeness or perfection. And, you know, and, and the Bible has a lot to say about the number seven. I'm not really going to go into detail on that today because that's not the purpose of the message. But just touching a few things. We know on the seventh day, God rested after he did his, his, his creation, his work. You'll see that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. So seven is important to God. This is the seventh month that we're in. Okay? Um, we know... Uh, uh, um, what do we see with Pharaoh? Pharaoh had uh, two dreams, did he not? And he saw seven cattle coming out of the Nile, mm -hmm. right? He saw seven fat and seven lean, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, this number is speaking of completeness, perfection, salvation. There, it's, it's important to God, and since it's important to God, it should be important to you and myself. Remember Samson? What was special about him? He was the strongest man physically that ever lived on planet Earth, right? Yeah. Yes, he still is, right? Okay, what did he have? He had seven locks. Yeah. That's the key to his secret. Yeah. All right, yeah. he, his, his hair grew in seven locks. Yeah. And, 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 and one of the commandments that his parents received, it was not to cut his hair. Yeah. When, he, when he allowed his hair to be cut, that's when he lost the anointing. That's when he lost his power. And when he, you say, well, Samson didn't allow that. Yes, he did. He, gave, he told the secret to Delilah. Mm -hmm. He told the enemy his secret. And the enemy doesn't play fair. <laughs> and you know some of you who's playing with the devil I want you to know the devil does not play fair okay he, the, the devil is who he is he's come to kill steal and destroy Amen. he's not playing fair at all when it comes to the spiritual walk do not tiptoe around him do not entertain him do not uh, get in bed with him do not fellowship with him you keep your distance from him as far as you can don't have anything in your life that gives him a reason to have a legal right to come against you or to attack you or, or to to come against you i like jesus the night before he was crucified he, he he told judas judas you go and do your thing do it quickly he told he's also told his, the disciples said the enemy has nothing in me so because the enemy had nothing in jesus when the enemy used the Roman soldiers to kill Jesus, it was illegal. He fell into a the enemy fell into a trap. Okay? Because the enemy had, did not have a legal reason to touch Jesus. Right? When you, find yourself being when you find yourself being oppressed, sometimes being afflicted, 
check yourself to see have I given the enemy a legal reason yes. just just check yourself that's why the Bible says very clearly in the New Testament it says submit yourself to God then what resist the devil it doesn't say resist the devil and then submit it gives you the order submit yourself to God because sometimes God enemies coming against us you know and sometimes he has a, a good reason for it in other words a legal reason Right? So if we submit ourselves to God first, God can show to us, says, look, this is an area where you allow the enemy to come in or you need to repent of that or, or get rid of that or change your behavior or change your attitude. We can repent, can we not? And when we repent, then, then, then we can turn around through and by the blood of Jesus, through and by the name of Jesus, we can rebuke the devourer. We can Amen. rebuke Satan. Say, Satan, get out of here. Get out of my life. Get out of my marriage. Get out of my finances. Get out of my affairs. And the enemy will, will try to lie to you. He says, well, you're guilty of this. He says, no, it's under the blood. Amen? Amen? It's, it's what? It's under the blood. I've repented of that. Hallelujah. So you don't have no legal right to continue what you're attempting to do, what you have been doing. It's over. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Remember Mary Magdalene. How many devils did she get cast out of her? Seven. Mm -hmm. Right? So it shows you the, the extent of how the enemy had her. He had her completely. Right? All right. It's, again, it's just giving you a sense. All right. From book of Genesis, we see seven. We see all the way down to the book of Revelations. So since, since it's important to God, it's important to us. Yes. Mm. Every seven years, Hebrew slaves were to be set free. Right. That's the way it was. Mm. Right. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Every seven times seven, 49 years plus one, 50 jubilee, uh, pe uh, the, the Israelites were to get back their inheritance. Mm. All right? Um, it's all to do with seven. Yeah. All right? So, just, again, just showing you how important seven is to God, to all of us, and therefore we should not let this slip, this month go by um, without seriously considering allowing God to work with us, mm -hmm. allowing God to manifest Himself, mm -hmm. getting the victory getting the breakthroughs, getting that healing, whatever it is you need from God, just receive it from God, positioning yourself, because we're in that month. Yes. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You, you, we have a reason to shout. We have a reason to make a loud noise. And, and I trust, if you're thinking, well, I don't know why I should be doing this, I trust before this message is over, you allow the Holy Spirit to show you why you should, why you have a reason. Hallelujah. First thing, right off the bat, if you even need to think about it, um, we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. We have overcome the world. When you give your life to Jesus, when you, when you give your life to Jesus, you become a born-again Christian, you've got the victory in Jesus Christ. You've overcome the world. That's something to shout about. Glory to God. You're on your way to, to other victories, but that's the main victory you have to get before you can go forward. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Let me go back to Leviticus chapter 23. The word of God says here, again in verse 24, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall it be a Sabbath, a memorial, blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. So here we see this word, uh, teruah, the Hebrew word. And, it's, it's, and part of that word, of that Hebrew word, teruah, is ruah. And it's just three Hebrew letters. But basically what it means is a sound burst of sound. All right? Like, sorry, sorry. A sudden burst of sound. All right? Okay? Brought about, and it can be brought about by human beings. Okay? Um, and you see, namely, in um, um, aggressive war cry. If you want to write down this reference, you'll see in Joshua chapter 6, verse 10. All right? And um, you, again, here's another reference. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 52. Okay, it can also be brought about um, a defensive alarm. So when one is blowing, a, a, you know, making an alarm for defense. Yeah. Okay, you see it in Judges seven verse twenty-one, a cry, a cry for of distress. You know, it's a cry of alarm. It's a shout. Yeah. When somebody is in distress, they don't cry quietly, mm -hmm. right? Amen. If 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 you are drowning, mm -hmm. you're not gonna say. You're gonna, sh you, all your strength that you can muster up, whatever that is, you're gonna shout to the top of your voice, Help! Are you not? Yeah. All right, it's, it's an alarm. 
Are you, are you, are you, are you seeing this? Okay. All right. It, it's also a triumphant shout. Glory to God. This is what it's about. A triumphant shout. All of us have something to shout about. Whether you got a shofar or not, it's all about, we should have something. If you're a born again believer, you've got something to shout about. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And it, it can be a, a, a shout of applause. Amen. Glory to God. This moment ago, we were clapping and worshiping Jesus, worshiping God. Okay? It's all part of that. <laughs> Hallelujah. It, okay? It could be uh, for joy. You, you find out throughout the Psalms, it tells us to make what? A joyful sound unto the Lord. Amen? Amen? Amen. And, you know, and if you're looking for one, it's Psalm 65, verse 13. Right? So I'm just giving you some, 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 some um, usage how this word ruah, which is part of teruah, is used throughout the Scriptures. Mm -hmm. And so, again, mainly meaning shouting, mm -hmm. an alarm, a, a, a war cry, yes. you, you know, so that you kind of get the sense of what it's all about. All right? So, again, just, just to give you further definition, just reiterate some things, it's an, that the shout is an alarm of war. Okay? A war cry. A battle cry. You know, it's a blast. In other words, you go with me for a moment to Numbers chapter 10. And it talks about um, when the trumpet is blown, the silver trumpets are blown, and um, again, trumpets, shofars, all that, when the, you know, the ram's horn is blown, there's a time of gathering, there's a time of, of, of going forward. So it, it, in other words, it's, it, it's a, a, you know, the trumpet is blown, it means we've got to go forward. We've got to leave where we are to got, start moving. Amen. If it's to gather in the, in the, in the Israelites, in the, whether in the wilderness, to gather the tabernacle, or pack up and let's go, we're out of here, we're leaving. Right? It's also, again, I was saying, like a, a shout of joy, all that. So when we see this, hallelujah, glory to God, we have a better appreciation for it. Numbers chapter 10, are you there? Let me just read a few scriptures. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 2, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of the whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them in the calling of the assembly for the journeying of the camps. Notice this. To bring the people to what? Together. Calling an assembly. I'm, I'm just showing you how how um, the, the blowing can be the, the used, right? And, and God is telling them. He says, he, he's, 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 he's telling them. So, if one was to dig further and see the Hebrew of this, you will see that it, it's using um, a, 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 a word called uh, tekiah, which means a, a long blast. All right? Because there's different blasts. You know, like somebody's playing a trumpet, you've got different notes and all that. Yes, yes. Well, on a shofar, you don't really have different notes like a, like a playing a trumpet or a saxophone or any of these horns. But there's certain sounds you can make. And when a, a long blast was made, it's called a tekiah, it, it means that uh, they were to gather at the tabernacle. So if I was to make a loud blast, it, you know, maybe something like this. It's long. <laughs> Imagine we'll probably go on and on and on, right? Okay, so that's the kind of blast that will be made there. And he goes on to say, and if, and if they blow but one trumpet, then the princes, which are the heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee, right? So in verse 5, it says, when you blow an alarm, now this is different. Now the Hebrew word for this is a teruah, right? And it means like it's short staccato. Like short blasts, like ta 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 ta, like this, somewhat like this. Instead of it being long, it's going to be short. You can see that. So, so short staccato blast like that is 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 teru means that. And in verse five says, "Then ye blow when ye blow an alarm, which is short." Then the camps that lie on the east parts shall go forward. It's time to move. Yes. They're not gathering at the temple at the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. 
right? It's, you know, we're moving, we're out of here. Right? We're leaving, yeah. right? And, and verse 6 says, and when, and when you blow an alarm the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey, and ye shall blow an alarm for their journeys. So when they're moving out, the trumpet's going to be blown. So if you know anything about the Old Testament, how the tabernacle was, you had three tribes on the north side, three tribes on the, on the east side, three tribes on the south side, three tribes on the west side. Right? And it's telling you that when, the first, when, the, when they hear the first uh, Turura blast, right, the, 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 the camp that was on the east side was to leave first. Then the camp after that was the uh, south. Yeah. You, you see, they, they, they left in order. Mm -hmm. right? when, when they were moving from point A to point B. Yeah. Right? And so it's telling us the uses of the blowing of the, sh of the trumpets, it's these particular silver trumpets, Right, but that they're still the, the the concept, the spiritual principles are still the same. But notice it says the alarm, and that's what we're talking about today. Is the alarm, Amen. all right? And you can see that the sound can be mixed up with short and long. For example, like this. You know, so there could be a combination of that. You know, and. So, there's four different sounds. I just shared with you two. And no doubt the people of God knew the distinction of the sound. They knew exactly what it meant. They knew when a certain sound came, it was a leader supposed to go meet at the tabernacle. Moses wants to meet with them. God wants to meet with them. When they heard another sound, a certain sound, they knew, whoa, whoa, we got to get out of here. Let's get our stuff all packed up. We're leaving. Mm -hmm. Amen? We're out of here. We're moving from point A to point B. Amen? So it's, so it's fitting, if we tie this to the New Testament, it's fitting when Jesus comes for the church, he's not going to come without the sound of a trumpet. First Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us, this, there will be the trump of God, it will be blowing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It will not be without a sound of a trumpet. Amen. And rest assured, since it's God's trumpet, it'll be loud, and I believe, this is just my personal feeling, I believe, personal belief, I believe everybody's going to hear it. If they're physically sleeping, they're going to wake up and wonder what is going on. All right? It's going to be so powerful that even those who are dead, their bones they're, they're, are, are in the grave, they're going to wake up. Their, body, their, their spirit is going to reunite with their bodies and they're going to come out of those graves with their glorified bodies. Glory to God. That's how powerful when God blows that. Glory to God. So notice in this same chapter, it goes on. It says in verse 8, and the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets, or you could substitute a shofar, and they shall be for you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. In other words, the sound of the trumpet, from God's point of view, the sound of the shofar is going to be around for a long time. It's not going anywhere. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And, and he goes on to say, if you go to war, don't forget to blow the shofar. Don't forget to blow the trumpet. Now, now as we read the scripture, you can apply it to your own personal life. If you're going through a spiritual battle, Right? If it would work for the Israelites when they went for battle and they were to blow the shofar to ensure they would get the victory, to, to get God's help, don't you think God will do the same in your life today? Amen. That, that's why I say personally, every believer who understands these scriptures should have an, a spiritual weapon called the shofar. Here's one of them, the ram's horn. Yeah. Every believer should have one. When you understand the Old Testament and you read it, and all that, and you see what God did when they blew the shofar, and it's the miraculous that took place, you should have one too, and know when to blow it. Don't wait to, for uh, a day like today to blow it. If trouble comes, you blow it. Amen. Amen. You got something to rejoice about? You blow it. Amen. You got your, eye, your, your tithes and offerings, you want to give it to God even before you come to the house of God? Take your short tithes and offerings. And blow over it. You'll see in a moment, I'm going to read some scriptures. There's blessings. It comes up as a moral before God. The sound of the voice of the shofar is significant to God. He pays attention to that sound. Remember, he's tying it back to the lamb. Yes. Mm. Amen. Mm. The lamb that took the place of Isaac. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Jesus is the lamb of God. And the lamb had horns. Mm -hmm. Right. And the sound is coming out. It's speaking volumes when God hears it. Amen. The devil trembles. When the, the sound of the shofar is blown by a righteous, holy person. Things happen supernaturally. 
Go with me again. Listen to what it says here in the book of Numbers chapter 10. Um, we just read in verse 8, God is telling them this is going to continue as an ordinance throughout, throughout your generations, plural. And the verse 9 says, if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets. Are you hearing that, saints? Glory to God. And ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. This is a promise. God is saying when you blow the, sh the, sh the shofar, when you blow the trumpet, when trouble comes and you're doing battle, he's talking to his people, but it also applies to you individually, whatever you're going through and all that, and you know you're in a battle. God said, when I hear that sound, you see, it's going to take faith for you to do this. When I hear that sound, he said, I, you, he, he said I, I'll remember you. Glory to God. I will remember you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And I'll save you from your enemies. Two promises. I'll remember you and save you. Glory to God. Why do we blow the shofar in a day like today? We've got a lot to rejoice about. Amen. And then look, look, look at verse 10. It says, also on the day of your gladness. Is this a day of gladness? Absolutely. And in your solemn days, okay? And in the beginnings of your months. This is the beginning of a new biblical month. Okay? And the beginning of your months. Ye shall blow with the trumpets. Or with the shofar. Over your burnt offerings. Over your sacrifices. Over your peace offerings. That they may be to you for a memorial before your God. Hallelujah. That's what we do at Passover time. Yeah. Right? That's what we do at Pentecost time. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. And you know what? I know we prayed over the offerings already, but let's bring them back out before we leave and let's blow over them. Mm -hmm. Amen. And if you haven't given the way you should and could have for a time like this, you may want to reconsider because we're going to blow over them so that they come up as a memorial before God. Whatever you're believing God for, you tell God, says, Lord, I'm believing you for this. You said in the time of feast, I should not come, what? Empty handed. Right? So it'll come up for you for a moment. It'll come up that they may come to you for, for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. So whatever your, rep, your offerings represent, when the shofar, the trumpet is blown over them, whether it's a solemn day, whether it's a day of gladness, whether it's the first day of the month, the biblical month, it'll come up before God as a memorial. God. You may say, Lord, I'm sowing the seed. To you, I'm giving to the work of God because I need a job. Well, is that a good reason for it to come up before the moral of God? I guess what? Well, when he comes before God, he says, you know what? John needs a job. Okay, let's see what we're going to do to get him a job. Hallelujah. You know, you know, Harry sends another request up. He says, Harry's having a problem with his wife. Okay, let's see what we can do to help him to do his part so it might be well with him. Mm -hmm. Amen. And then you might get someone like coming like from Sarah. Sarah can't get pregnant. Okay, let's see what we can do for Sarah. Oh, or Hannah. Oh, let's see what we can do for Hannah. Are you hearing this, saints? Praise God. Let's not miss these opportunities. Uh -huh. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm reminding you of some stories in the book of Joshua. You remember him? Joshua chapter 6. Hallelujah. He's, in chapter 6, Joshua is in the land of the promised land. All right? They've crossed over from the wilderness into the promised land. And in verse 5, the Bible tells us, it says, And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, you know, in other words, God was telling Joshua the strategy of how they're going to get the victory over Jericho. Jericho was a city that was walled up. The walls were high, the walls were thick, and it was impenetrable. You know, it was... The, no, under normal circumstances, one could not penetrate that wall. And the, and the people in Jericho felt quite confident being behind the wall. The walls, I should say. But God had another plan. Yeah. God's, God was going to put them to shame. The very thing that they were putting their confidence in, God was going to remove the very thing yes. that they put their confidence in. Amen. Right? Praise so so he's, 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 he, he gave Joshua the strategy of what to do. So and we're just jumping right into this in verse 5. And it shall come to pass that when you shall make a long blast, so that will be what? A tikiah, right? Mm -hmm. Right? A long sound, yeah. right? With the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout. Now, this word, shout, if, if you were to look it up, it's along the same lines as 
Alarm. Yes. The same root Hebrew word. In other words, remember I was saying before, you can make a sound, a blast, a loud noise through the shofar, through the trumpet, also with your mouth. Okay? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And all the people shall shout with a great shout. And you'll see, if you look at some other scriptures, it's when the people of God made the great shout with their mouths, that's when things happened. Yeah. Hallelujah. It's like the shofar. Yeah. All right? Are, are you you're hearing it? And, and the wall of the city shall come down flat. Yeah. You may want to underline that word flat because it literally did come down flat. It wasn't the rubble that the, that the Israelites had to climb over. And I didn't know that until the very first time we went to Israel and we saw the excavation of the walls. They had excavated the walls and the walls were still intact. That day, God sent his angels and they pushed the walls down into the earth. Glory to God. Glory to God. And, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. He's not climbing over boulders. He's not climbing over rubble. Glory to God. And verse 6 says, And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take an ark of the covenant, take up the ark of the covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns. What are those? Those are shofars, right? Before the ark of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You're seeing this? Jump down to verse 20. So the people shouted, right? Right? When the priest blew with the trumpets. This would be the last day. Remember they were to march around seven days? Mm -hmm. On the last day they were to march around how many times? Seven. seven. There's that number seven again, right? Okay, remember it speaks of completion? Yes. It speaks of salvation? Yes? yes? Okay. We're, we're talking about the number seven? Yes. It speaks of what? Perfection. Yes. Right? Yes. Right? Okay, so always take note of that. Okay, so the scripture says, so they, so the, you know, they're, march, they're marching around. Now the time has come for them to shout. Okay, so the people shouted again. It's the same thing as the alarm. It's the same thing as what we're looking at, right? Teruah, right? Okay, when the priest blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. So that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Oh, glory to God. Praise the Lord. Glory to the Lamb of God. Yes. Glory, 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 glory. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Glory to God. Look at another example when um, leaders of Israel needed to gather the people. We see an example, uh, you don't have to turn to it, but I'll just read you in Judges. Chapter 26 and verse, sorry, Judges chapter 3, verse 26 to 27. We see a, a, a judge called Ehud. He was one of the leaders of Israel. And Ehud, and it says, And Ehud escaped while he tarried, while they tarried, and, and passed before the quarries and escaped unto Serath. So he had just assassinated the, the, the leader of the enemy that has been oppressing them. Yeah. You'll have to read the verses before that. So he escaped. And after he escaped, after he assassinated the leader of the enemy that was oppressing them, it says in verse 27, And it came to pass, when he was come, that he blew a, shof a trumpet, you could use the word shofar, in the mount of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from, mount, from the mount, and, be and he before them. In other words, the people heard the sound and knew it, and they were what? Gathered. All right? And they went and had the victory. Further. It didn't, it didn't stand, it didn't, it didn't, it brought them together. Here's another one. In Gideon, the, um, when, when the, in Judges chapter 6, verse 33 and 34, the Bible tells us in verse 33 that the Midians and the, and the Amalekites the, uh, gathered themselves and they came and pitched them the, the, in the valley of Ze Jezreel. They were ready to do battle. They were ready to wipe out the, the Israelites that were there. And verse 34 says, But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet and Abiezer was gathered after him. So the people gathered together. And remember, Gideon was the fellow that God gave us the strategy how to defeat the Midianites and the Amalekites. Sure. Remember that? Yeah. I mean, 30,000 uh, 30, plus soldiers came out first. God says, hey, Gideon, it's too much. If, if, uh, I'm not going to give you the victory with these fellows because if I do, Israel will pride themselves that they did it all by themselves. Send home those mm -hmm. who are fearful. Okay. Well, if you read the story very carefully, I mean, I think it's about a, 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 several thousand of them went home. Amen. It was good. At least 10,000 of them went, went, went home. So that reduced the number down to around 20,000 20, plus. 
Well, you know, again, if you continue to read the story, God said to Gideon, says, no, it, there's still too much. Um, and I said, this is how we're going to test them. And he went through a series of selecting them when he came all the way down to 300 men plus Gideon. Amen. And, 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 and God gave him the strategy. He basically said, you get the shofar, right? The ram's horn. Yeah. And, and uh, when you blow it and you smash the pitcher, I'm going to give you the victory. Amen. All glory to God. God. So, uh, uh, in verse chapter 7 of the book of 18, sorry, chapter 7 of the book of Judges, verse 18, the Bible says, uh, Gideon is speaking, When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp. And he's telling his army what they're going to do. And in verse 20 says, And the three companies blew the trumpets, or the shofars, and break the pitchers, and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets or shofars in their right hands to blow with all. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and, the, and of Gideon. Notice that when they blew the shofars and they smashed the pitchers, they had a shout, a shout of alarm coming from their mouth. I, I need you to, to see that sense, okay? All right? They made the alarm sound through the shofar, but they also made the alarm sound through their mouths. Just like what happened, we just read with Joshua and the Israelites when they marched around the city of Jericho. When they shouted after the, the, the shofar was blown, the trumpets were blown, that's when the, the miracles took place. Yeah. That's when the walls came down. Yeah. Hallelujah. All oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. So the scripture tells us in verse 21 that when all this happened and they shouted, verse 21 says, and they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the hosts ran and cried and fled. Imagine, Gideon's army just stood still. They did exactly what Gideon told them to do. Gideon told them exactly what God told them to do. It's effortless. This is an effortless anointing. Effortless victory. They don't really have to lift their hand except to follow the instruction. Blow the shofar, make the alarm, shout with your voice, smash the pitches, and now the, and the Amalekites and the Midianites are in confusion. Well, I believe you know the story. They ended up killing each other, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Verse 22 says, And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. And the hosts fled to Bashita in Zeruhath, and on the border of Abel Mehola unto Tebas. Hallelujah. What do we see there? Great victory for blowing the shofar. Praise God. We also see another occasion when the trumpet or the shofar is used, when they crown the king. Mm -hmm. Prophetically, it is believed that uh, the Feast of Trumpets not only does it have to do with uh, uh, catching away the saints and all that, but the crowning of the Messiah, Jesus. Amen. Glory to God. God. And, and, and I'll give you an example. When Solomon was crowned, the shofar, the trumpet was blown. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 33, 34, you'll see this, hallelujah. It says, And the king also said unto them, Take with you the servants, your Lord, and cause Solomon my son to ride upon mine own mule, and bring him down to Gihon. This is, this is uh, David talking to his servants, right? And, and let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him their king over Israel. And blow ye the trumpet, or Amen. blow ye the shofar. It's all to do with coronation. And say, God save King Solomon. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, verse 39 tells us, And Zadok the, the priest took a horn of oil out of the tabernacle, anointed Solomon, and they blew the trumpet. And all the people said, God save King Solomon. In other words, there was a sh the, the sound, the loud sound of the trumpet, the the shofar, and you know, because if you read it, the, the, the camp, the other one who was usurping his authority, his other brother, they all heard it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And fear came into their hearts when they heard it. Mm -hmm. Because they knew something was wrong, something had changed, and guess what? You're not the real king. You're a false king. You're a usurper. And it, the true one is on the throne. It was Solomon, right? And all the people said, God save King Solomon. Did you think they said that quietly? It was a shout. 
because it ran throughout. Again, if you read the scriptures before and after, you'll see for yourself. It ran throughout. God does miracles when the shofar is blown and a shout is accompanied with it. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. It's also used um, uh, in praise. So if you think, well, oh, I don't know, this is too loud for me, what's going on? Well, let's look at some scriptures. Second, Corinthians, Second Chronicles chapter 5. Verse 13. 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13. In other words, don't hold back. It's a day for making joyful sound unto the Lord. And, and by now, the scriptures I've shared with you, you should have plenty of reasons to be making that joyful sound with your shofar if you've got one, but everyone has a mouth. And with the least with your mouth. Amen? Glory to God. 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13. This is what it says. And it came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanks, thanking the Lord. This is when they were dedicating the temple. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Hallelujah, saints. This was when they were worshiping and praising God. Some are singing. Hallelujah. And while some are singing, some are blowing the shofar. It's all taking place. Some are shouting. Yes. It was, the scripture says it was all one noise. It was all to do with praise and worshiping God. And the, the Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. And he saturates that place with his presence to the point where the priests could not stand. Did God visit them that day? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the miracles were taking place. So saints, in a moment, let's continue. Let's worship God. Let's rejoice. Glory to God. Hallelujah. One more passage I want to share with you. In a time of trouble, hallelujah, the, 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 the children of Judah, you can go with me in 2 Chronicles chapter 13, did not forget their roots. Okay? Did not forget what they had been taught. Now, at this time, there are uh, 10 tribes have gone their own separate way. They've uh, got their own king. They were in a Backslidden state. First chronic, Second Chronicles, chapter thirteen. And there's a king called uh, um, Jeroboam. Boam. He was not a good king. He was an evil king. He led them in idol worship, and uh, so there was civil war between the ten tribes and the tribe of Judah. And, and you have to remember. Benjamin was always aligned with the tribe of Judah. So 10 against 2, yeah. right? And, and that's the way it was. Two kingdoms. They call it the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom was Judah and Benjamin. And the northern kingdom was the other 10 tribes. So they've, they've got a conflict. I'm just giving you the context for this passage. I want you to read it for yourself. We're not going to look at all the verses. But there, there are conflict be between them. But go with me to, again, chapter 13, 2 Chronicles chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 12. All right? And the Word of God says... And these are the people from Judah are, are, are speaking back. You know, before war breaks out, there's always an exchange of words, is there not? Yes. And, and, and the words can become words of, of fighting words, war of war, words of anger. This, you, this is what we're going to do to you if you don't, you, you know, words of, words of threats. All right? All right. So what we see here, again, I'm encouraged you to read the verses before. He says, the word of God says in verse 12, And behold... This is the, the people of Judah speaking to the northern kingdom, to Jeroboam and the likes of him. God himself is with us for our captain. So you better think twice about attacking us. You may have the numbers. You outnumber us. But you better stop to think about what you're planning to do. Because the, the, the people of Judah, the priests, the, I mean the leaders of Judah are plainly saying God is with us. And if you mess with us, you're going to have to answer to God. Uh -huh. That's the message, right? And his priest with sounding trumpets to cry an alarm against you. 
That's their, that's their weapon. We've got the priests. Not only do we have the priests, they know how to blow the shofar. And when they blow the shofar, when they blow the trumpet, they know how to get God's attention because they're going to do it God's way. Amen. Remember what we just read in Numbers chapter 10? So this is the, what the, people, the leaders of Judah are saying to the leaders of the northern kingdom. And they're pleading with them, O children of Israel, fight ye not against the Lord God of your fathers, for ye shall not prosper. What are they saying? Once we blow the shofar, you're not fighting against us. You're fighting against God. Yeah. And you're not going to prosper. Well, you know, this is what it goes on to say. Um, it, it, it goes on to say in verse 13. So, I, you know, while all this is the exchange in words, Jeroboam decides to ambush them. He says, well, I'll show you a thing or two. But watch it, what it says here. But jo Jeroboam caused an ambushment to come about behind them in order to surprise them. So they were before Judah, and the ambushment was behind them. So they're kind of like surround them. They're in front of them and behind them. They weren't expecting to get attacked from behind. Remember, the devil doesn't play fair. All right? Don't ever forget that. He doesn't play fair. All right? Okay? Okay? And uh, um, verse 14 says, And when Judah looked back, and behold, the battle was before and behind. Remember, they're outnumbered. Now they're surrounded. The enemy is in front of them. The enemy is behind them. Yeah. What do they do? They cried an alarm. Yeah. It says, and they cried unto the Lord. It's an alarm. It's the same kind of alarm that we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about teruah. All right? Yeah. That, that, that shout that's coming. You know, they cry, from their mouth, they cried, a, 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 they cried unto the Lord. And the priest sounded with the trumpet. They did both things. Amen. Praise God. Supernaturally, God intervened. Yeah. Because God is true to His Word. He's the same today as He was yesterday and He will be, will be tomorrow. He said, if you blow the shofar, you blow the trumpet, it will come up to before me as a memorial. I will remember you. I will save you from who? Your enemies. Is that what He said? Yes. Well, these, the, the, the leaders of Judah, the priests, they remembered it. And they're warning the, 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 the leaders, Jeroboam and his leaders, says, don't do this because you're not going to be fighting against us. It's God you're going to be fighting. Yeah. Well, the next verse says, and the men of Judah gave a shout. That's an alarm shout. Mm -hmm. And as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. Notice it didn't occur until they shouted. It didn't occur until the shofars, the trumpets were blown. They both went together, saints. Hallelujah. And, and, and I want to encourage you on this day of trumpets or Yom Tur, day of blowing trumpets, the day of making that loud noise with the trumpets and with your voice. God is the same as He was yesterday, He is today, and will be tomorrow. He hasn't changed. What is it you believe in God for? Mm. Just do what God says. Make a joyful noise. Get that shofar and blow it. Glory to God. And make that shout. Praise Him. Worship Him. Glorify Him. If you want to decree some things, then do it. The soldiers with Gideon says, uh, the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. That's their shout. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Find something to shout about. Some, some, find something to shout about. Glory to God. And, and, don't, and don't wait for a day like today to blow the shofar. You, the, I've just showed you from the scriptures many reasons why you would want to blow it. You can blow it in time of, times of praise and worship. You can blow it in time of trouble. You can, you can blow it in, uh, in offerings times. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Your sacrifices you make, bring it up to God. Hallelujah. There's no end on this. Because it's the voice, the shofar when it's blown is the voice of the Lord in the earth. Remember, it reminds God of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. The Lamb that took the place of Isaac. Hmm. It reminds of the true Lamb, the Lamb of God. Are you hearing this? Yes. And if you're a holy person, you're a believer, you blow it. Things have to happen. 
Not maybe. It has to. All you have to do is just do your part and by faith. And God will do the rest. The Israelites marched around Jericho by faith for seven days. They, they marched around the last day seven times. They blew the shofar. They shouted by faith. They saw the results. Gideon with 300 men. They did similar. Broke up into three companies. 100 here, 100 here, 100 there. Blew the shofar. Praise Smashed the pitchers. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Shouted. God did the rest. In other words, when man does his part according to the word of God, God will do the rest. Amen. Amen. Judah was surrounded. They were ambushed by the northern kingdom. What did they do? They cried an alarm with their mouths. Did they not? Yes. They shouted with their mouths. Amen. If you were them, if you were there, you would too. Right? And they did not forget to blow the shofar. It came up as a remembrance before God and supernaturally God turned that whole thing around. Amen. God will do the same to you. There's nothing that you're facing that can't be, that's impossible to God that God cannot turn around Amen. on a day like today. Amen. Since this is, the, this is the first day of the seventh month, let this be the beginning, a new beginning for you. Amen. Amen. Let, let it be a time of transformation. Let it be a time of change. Let it be a time of whatever you want it to be. Hallelujah.